this works? Yes. Hi. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, perhaps a bit more of a global picture of why I think that uh, open science is important. And in particular, I'm going to focus on open hardware because there has been a lot of talk about data. And, um, and this is the reason why I talk about this is because this was my initial motivation of how I got into open science and to, into open labware. And the thing is that uh, there is not such a thing as a local problem anymore. All problems we have, they become global. And I think this is best exemplified by the case of Zika virus uh, that happened a couple of years ago. This was a local problem only in some regions. Oh, the pointer doesn't work on the screen. Well, this was a, <laughs> yeah, well. Um, this was a problem that um, was only in some regions around the equator. And I still needed to pass my slides, though. So. <laughs> um, and then um, in, in a very short period of time, it became a global problem, um, and everyone was worried about it. And if the researchers locally uh, at the place where this was a local problem who have, have the resources and the ability uh, to, to perform the science and the implementation that was needed, maybe this would have not ever become a global problem and it would have just stayed local. The same goes for Ebola, if you remember a very classical case of a local problem that very quickly became global, a global concern. Um, and uh, what this means to me is that research output needs to be more global. And I think the best way to explain this is through images, because otherwise I can spend uh, a lot of time just talking. Um, so this is a map of the world that uh, the size of each country has been resized by its area. So it looks a bit different to what we are used to because uh, the maps that we are used to, they don't fully reflect the area of the countries. Um, but we can reshape this um, according to different things. So for example, uh, we can reshape it according to the number of cases of malaria yearly. Uh, and this is how it looks. The map suddenly looks very, very different. And what I find striking is that if now we compare this with the map reshaped by um, research output per country, this is how it looks. And what we try to achieve in Trend, uh, that is the organization I founded, is to try to make this a little bit less equal. And we try to imagine uh, what we could achieve as a society if science was truly a global resource. And I like to use this image because uh, I think it has a nice story behind. So this guy here, his name is Yunusan. He was uh, one of the first students I had when I gave the first course in Uganda. He's originally from Nigeria. And he's now doing a PhD in neuroscience in Germany, but he goes back to his university in Nigeria every year. He's an advisor there, and he also does a lot of outreach events. So this is during one of these outreach. He's delivering a master class in neuroscience to high school students in northern Nigeria, which you might have heard because there are a lot of problems with Boko Haram. And of course, there are loads and loads of problems to make this equality that I was talking about. And I, I won't talk about what we are doing to solve them and what, uh, what, is, what are the ways that we think that are going forward, but open science is definitely one of them. And in particular, one of the hurdles that, um, that we have encountered is that lab equipment, lab equipment is really expensive. So these are just two silly examples that I took because I think they really reflect the magnitude of the problem. So this thing here is a ball dropper. So I had to do some experiments in which I had to put little balls in each of the 96 well, uh, wells in a 96 well plate. This is just like little metallic balls. And then uh, there is this company that sells this piece of plastic that makes that a little bit easier because you can just flip it. Uh, and it costs $800. This is literally just, yeah, I know. <laughs> that was my reaction to when I saw it on the website. So it's just, this is just a piece of plastic. Um, and the same goes like a gel comb. Most people that do molecular biology will know. Uh, it's just a piece of plastic as well to cast your gel. That's $77. So this is a problem. And this is a problem, especially in places with low resources. Uh, and that's a problem that I encounter when I start teaching um, as part of this organization, as I mentioned, that is called TREND, that stands for Teaching and Research in Natural sciences for development in Africa. And at the beginning, we were just improvising because we, we, had to, we wanted to teach about science with the resources that were locally there. Um, so we'll, for example, use uh, as a camera for our microscope a very cheap webcam um, put together with chopsticks. 
or if we had a power cut, we will uh, use some batteries to run our gels, for example. And little by little, we will become better at it. We were uh, informally teaching students how to do this, and at some point, we decided to make a formal education. So we um, started a program on uh, building your own lab equipment, where we teach researchers that are mostly biologists with no experience in, uh, in any hardware or building equipment, uh, some very basic principles so that they can implement their own equipment. Um, and one of the things that they, one of the tools that we teach them about is Arduinos, that they are just microcontrollers. This is a piece um, of equipment, you can say, you can buy them for 10 francs, uh, that you put in between your computer and your hardware, and that will help you instruct your hardware what you wanted to do with it. Uh, we also tell them about Raspberry Pis. These are very cheap computers, just for 40 francs, uh, and they do, they are quite slow, but they do everything that a basic computer will do. And we teach them how to solder these things together and how, how to put things together. And I just want to show you quickly uh, a video from one of the students of this year's uh, school that we had in Nigeria. Because he explains, so this guy, he had no prior experience with uh, building equipment. Uh, the course is two weeks. The first uh, three days uh, are about uh, some basic concepts on open hardware, uh, and then they have to develop a project. And they can choose the project they want to develop, and then they just have to make it happen. So this guy, in one week and a half, he built a PCR machine. And I don't know if everyone knows what a PCR machine is, but uh, this is uh, the most basic uh, piece of lab equipment in a biology lab. It does a very simple thing. And so for the non-biologists, the only thing it does is that you can um, uh, program a series of cycles, so it will cycle in the temperature. It's just a metal block, and then it will very precisely switch the temperature of this metal block, in, and you can program simple cycles of this temperature. And it sounds very silly, but it's very important for molecular biologists, and it costs about 3,000, 4,000 francs. So it's quite expensive. And in a week and a half, this is what this guy did. So I just want to show you the video. I hope the audio works. Uh, and then I will comment on some of the things that he mentions, because he explains it really well. And the audio is not working? No. Sorry. Well, if, I mean, can I connect the other, yes. the one of the mic? Maybe that's easier. No? And then I reconnect the so, mic. So if the is on YouTube. No, it's just on the presentation. Sorry. If not, I will just do the voiceover. <laughs> Let's see. All right, all right. So Aziz, so tell me what. So the the, the instructor, his name is Andre, and he's uh, he's asking him some questions. He's driving them so that he can explain what he has done with the PCR machine. What this is? Well, it's a simple open uh, PCR machine. Uh huh. Uh, can you more or less indicate what is what? Because you have a prototype, but it's a bundle of ma it's, a, okay, it's a big mess of wires right yeah, now. Right? Yes, this is of course this is our Arduino, which is the brain that tells uh, the material what to do. Uh -huh. uh, we've got a Peltier element, element that is used uh -huh. to provide the heating, yeah. and this is our aluminum heating block. Yeah. Uh, we're going to drill holes air for the PCR tubes, and then we have our H bridge uh -huh. uh, and our fan. Uh -huh. We because this thing actually produces a lot of heat, yeah. so the yeah. block, the big block, is supposed to help us to dissipate extra heat. Uh -huh. And then, so when we connect our um, Arduino, we have created cycles, different cycles. Uh, the uh, PCR can run for a specific number of cycles, create loops, and then with that, we, we are actually making the normal uh, conventional PCR machine. In the, uh, at least a simple fashion. Cool. So that is basically what we've got here. And uh, of course, yeah, the, the monitor, we are going to use the serial monitor on the, on the Arduino uh -huh. software to, to show the changes in temperature. Cool. And of course, we have tested it and it's, uh, it's actually working. <laughs> it's actually working. All right, man. Thank you very much. Thank and now the final question. Okay. Are there any documentations for this? Where is this all going to be somewhere? Or yes, we have the documentation. We have the videos, small short snippets of videos and pictures. Uh -huh. Although they have not been uploaded yet, uh -huh. uh, we will upload on uh, starting with on uh, Instructable. Yeah. And then it's going to be available on.
cool, man. Yes, of course, we also allowed it's an open source, so you can upload the video. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. So let me reconnect the mic here. Right. So I mean, I think it's, I like this video because he mentioned a lot of things. So he has the the Arduino, and the Arduino is saying the hardware what to do. Um, and I, I think it's particularly important the last uh, question that the instructor asked, that is, what about documentation? So the documentation is at the core of every open science, and as well uh, is at the core of open labware as well. And there are a lot of sites. Um, so one of them is Instructables, uh, but there is also Hackaday. And all of them have the same principle. Uh, there are different projects, there are contributors. Uh, in the projects, it explains what the project is, and there are the different files that you will need to be able to reproduce and build whatever it is uh, by yourself. Um, many people also actually publish papers with this, me included. And um, there is, so PLOS has um, a channel that is open source toolkit. It's actually um, curated by trend members as well. And uh, it tries to put together the best uh, open uh, labware uh, papers that have been published. Uh, so there are some coming up every week, and there are editors speak. Um, so if you are curious to see what is going on, it's amazing. There are many, many papers at the moment being published on open labware. So it's a good place to look. Um, of course, there are companies as well. Uh, and what is special about these companies is that, uh, in this case, open PCR, you can buy a cheaper PCR assemble or disassemble, but what is special about it is not that. What is special is that they have put their plans on. So basically, if you want, you can go to their website, download all the plans, and you can build their PCR machine without paying them anything. So I think that's the, that's the power of open labware. Another tool that we use besides the, the microelectronics is 3D printing. We use a lot of uh, 3D printing, and this is quite useful because uh, 3D printing was something very fancy before, but now it's quite obvious. So people often ask me, where do I find a 3D printer? This couldn't be easier. Well, in your case, at the EPFL, uh, there's a 3D printing service, so you can just go with your stick with your file and just print it. Uh, in most cities, there are hacker spaces that have 3D printers, so they will print your file uh, for a fee, just, just like a service. Um, and you can also buy and build your own. So these are the printers that we built at the, um, at the course. So in this course that I mentioned for open hardware, we, the first two days we spent building these printers, they cost 400 francs. And people without any prior experience can put them together in just two days. It's really, uh, everyone is qualified to do that. It's, if you can mount an IKEA table, you can build a 3D printer. So there is no reason to be scared of this. That everyone can do it. Um, and what things can you do? So for example, you can do pipettes. Uh, and what is beautiful about, three, about uh, open labware is that uh, someone makes a first model and publish it, and publish the design. And this one was not very good. It had a straw instead of a pipe tip, so it wasn't working too well. And then somebody modified and made something a little bit better, and somebody else took that design and modified even more. So at the end, if you were the first person who made the first pipe without, by just putting it up and sitting in your couch, you suddenly get a pretty good uh, pipe at the end. So it's good because the models can keep um, improving. Um, and of course, you can put together the printing and the electronics. So this is one of the projects that we did. It's called the FlyPy. So it's a microscope and uh, that has a 3D printed frame. And then the brain is an Arduino and a Raspberry Pi computer. And I don't have time to go into details, but it's quite amazing the kind of things that you can see. You can see neurons, you can see parasites, and you can do some pretty complex uh, neuro neuroscience experiments. Um, but. So I have been talking a lot about it being cheap, but sometimes it's not a question of money, sometimes it's a question of time. Um, so in my research, I'm a neuroscientist, and um, I had to do an experiment in which I had to acquire my data, it doesn't matter, but uh, to acquire my data, I use this very expensive uh, piece of equipment, it's an electrophysiology amplifier, it's absolutely incompatible with anything. Like the outputs that come out, they are only compatible also with the program that runs with this amplifier. And I needed to do this experiment in which I had to coordinate a pulse of light at the same time that I was recording. So this is what this green bar shows here. Um, if I would have had to ask a company to do this, 
I don't know how much it would have cost. I don't know how much time it would have taken. But I needed to do this experiment fast. So a quick Google uh, and little search on the internet. I could connect my Arduino uh, through a VNC cable to my, uh, to my amplifier. And then I could have my experiment working. So this is something that sometimes, even if you have all of the money in the world, you for sure won't have all the time. So sometimes you just want to do an experiment. And if you know how to do these little things, you can combine expensive equipment with your own main solutions. And then if you publish it, people will have access to it as well. And they will be able to use it and, and to improve it. Um, and of course, this is not just for biology. So this goes for physics as well. This is my last example. Um, this guy, his name is Ihab, uh, is one of our collaborators. He's the head of the physics department at the University of Khartoum in Sudan. And uh, he, he really wants to teach undergrads with practicals, but they don't have a lot of money at the university. So for example, he designed this ultrasonic signal generator for sound experiments so that the students there can learn about the speed of sound and all of those things. Um, and he published the design. So now if you want, you can just go to the paper and read how he did it, and you can replicate it as well. And uh, this goes even farther. So for example, Tesla has made all of their designs uh, open. So this means that if you want it, you could make your own Tesla car, probably not you, but maybe a company is going to take this design, improve them, make them cheaper. Um, there are underwater drones. There are so many projects out there. I particularly like this one. So um, this, there are a couple of TED talks from this guy. He's from Malawi, and he, I think he really so it's a great example of what open hardware means. He went to a library and read lots of books. And like that, he managed to make a windmill that provided electricity for his entire village. So I think this is what open uh, hardware is about. Uh, if the things are published and documented, other people can use them. And it can make a really huge difference. Um, so I would just like to finish with this picture again uh, to imagine what we could achieve uh, when uh, Science is really a global resource. And uh, I would just like to thank uh, Andre and Tom, uh, because they are really the driving force behind the open labware in Trend. And uh, this is where we put our designs. This is the website for Trend. And this is my email address if you want to contact me. And thanks for your attention. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Is there any question? I have a question. Yes. I was wondering how easy it was to engage people in trend. I mean, we were talking about researcher engagement and I mean, just spread the voice, create awareness and so on and so forth. But in this case, it's also, I mean, going there and I mean, just uh, create uh, learning uh, uh, courses. Uh, was it easy? Was it, I mean, uh, you, you find barriers? No, I found that, uh, to be honest, that wasn't, I mean, there are a lot of challenges in, in running the project. <laughs> but I think enthusiasm is not one of them. I think uh, we have loads of researchers uh, on this side, particularly I have always worked in Europe, so particularly in Europe, but also in the US, that they are happy to devote some of their time to, to help and to teach others. And then uh, we have, I mean, we don't go to universities preaching. We don't go anywhere that we are not requested. So in, from that sense, we have always felt very welcome. People request that we do courses there. They, so yeah. Uh, also, the courses, they are open to students uh, across the continent. So people have to actually apply. So from all, some of our courses, we get over 200 applications oh. for 20 spots. So it's, uh, yeah. So no, we haven't had problems. Okay. In that sense. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so I would like to thank our speakers. I would like to invite you for the operative to continue the discussion. And I also want just, uh, I mean, uh, to do a quick reminder. Tomorrow is the last day of this uh, Open Science Event in Talk series. We are going to discuss about code and tools to make really open science concretely. So you are warmly invited to, uh, to join us tomorrow as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.